Will you pray with me, please? Holy and loving God, what a privilege it is to be in this place this morning. To be in your presence and the presence of our loved ones. We ask again that you bless us this day. Shower your blessings upon us. Let us know that you are real in our lives by speaking to us into our hearts. For this, as in all things, we ask in that most holy name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, my friends. Good morning. What a pleasure it is to be back with you all, to be all dressed up again and worshiping with you, and to be back in the pulpit speaking what I hope and pray will be holy words this morning. I want to thank everyone who helped out while I was away, those who preached, Nancy Freiberg and Ann Friedrich and Leanne Carpenter, those who helped lead the worship services, Zach, everyone who helps each and every week that's on the rota, the choir, and of course, all of you who showed up and made this transition to this summer service schedule with this one 10 a.m. service. Thank you for doing that while I was away. <laughs> Thank you for working out the kinks, including I hear one Sunday when the air conditioning was not working. So thank you, everyone. I did miss you, but it was also nice to get away. Now, quite a few have, of you have asked me over the past week if I could schedule a time soon to tell you about where I went and what I did on my vacation. And I thought, well, why don't I just do that today? Instead of trying to schedule another time, we can all come back together here we are. Now, I do not have a slideshow of photos to share with you and bore you with, although you can go to my Facebook page and see a daily sort of photo blog of places I went. But I think a slideshow is not even actually necessary this morning. But what I want to tell you about is the experience I had. And this is one time, I think, while trying to keep in that parameter of speaking holy words, that pictures might actually get in the way. So let me begin by saying that while I did go on a journey, it was not a journey toward anything specific, nor was it a journey of getting away from anything specific. It was just a journey, one for which I did not have very many expectations before I left, but rather a high level of openness to whatever might occur. So a little less than a month ago, I boarded a plane here in Wilmington and ultimately landed in Spain. And after having one day to explore Madrid, I met up with three other people as we embarked together, at least initially, on a walk. What we were doing was actually the same thing millions upon millions of other people have done for a little over a thousand years now. And that was to go on a religious pilgrimage and walk a great distance through Spain to a little town on the northwest coast called Santiago de Compostelo. And the walk you go on to get there is called the Camino de Santiago. And Camino in Spanish means way, the way. And Santiago is Spanish for San, Saint Diego, James. So in English, this is the way of St. James. And, at least in theory, this Camino, this walk, this way, retraces some of the steps St. James himself took when he went to Spain to preach the gospel. 
James, if you remember, was one of the brothers of Jesus. There's a letter in the New Testament that he wrote, the letter of James. And he was one of the original apostles, going all the way to Spain from Jerusalem to spread the good news of God through Jesus Christ. And in this town where you end up, Santiago de Compostela, there's a huge, beautiful cathedral there, itself almost a thousand years old. And inside this cathedral is, is the tomb and earthly remains of St. James, which you can look at. Well, the tomb anyway. And because this is St. James's final resting place, this pilgrimage, this Camino, has been traveled by countless people over the past thousand years to go to the place where St. James is buried and to give him honor. And that is exactly what I was doing. Does St. James hold any special place in my life? outside of the fact of who he was and that part of our Bible was, was written by him? No, not really. <laughs> except, except that by embarking on this pilgrimage, I knew I would, be, I would be following not only in his footsteps, but the footsteps of millions of other people going back a thousand years and would be in the company of, of hundreds, of, if not thousands of other people making this pilgrimage at the same time I was. And that, to me, was and is a very powerful thing. And this walk, this Camino, this pilgrimage, well, it was very difficult, I will admit, much more difficult than I was anticipating anyway. I really didn't know what to expect, but um, I didn't expect it to be that hard. I knew we would be walking a lot, of course. That was the whole point. What I did not know is high, how high up in the mountains we would be. <laughs> in fact, it snowed the first two days of walking. And no... I did not bring gloves or a scarf or anything that would protect me from snow and sleet and hail about that big one day. Nor did I anticipate how much further up the mountains we would climb. We made it to about 1,500 meters. That's, you know, almost 5,000 feet. That's almost a mile. I'm not used to that. I live in Wilmington. You know, it's kind of flat here. And wouldn't you know, every single day, every single day, as soon as we left whatever little town we spent the night in, had our breakfast, sure enough, within the first ten minutes of walking, straight up another mountain we went. I kept saying, well, how, why are we only going up? <laughs> when do we go down? And let me be clear about something that most of you probably can already guess or know. I am not a hiker. I don't even like raising the incline on the treadmill at the gym. <laughs> I mean, truly, I was on this trip for the religious pilgrimage aspect of it all. I became a hiker. But you know, not everyone goes on this trip for the religious pilgrimage part. I mean, I would guess, just by talking with people, that Maybe 75% of the people who make this trip do it for the hiking experience. It's a wonderful trail. And do not have a religious experience at all. But it is spiritual. For it is nearly impossible to be that far up in the mountains, walking six, eight, ten hours a day, among some of the most beautiful scenery on earth, surrounded sometimes only by trees and meadows and cows, and other times in the company of 
of a small or perhaps even a large group of people all experiencing the same thing you are. And there is just this wonderful camaraderie and and fellowship and sense of being one even when most of the time we didn't even speak the same language. They say that the Camino changes you and that when you begin to near the end of the Camino you start to get a little sad because the experience is coming to an end. And as much as just about everything that could hurt on my body hurt, I was sad too that it was suddenly going to end. But they also say that each pilgrim realizes that while the Camino as a specific trail in Spain may be coming to an end, that life then becomes your Camino. And that is exactly what happened to me. (laughs) Although the walking and the hiking was at times extremely difficult for me, I, I, I made it every day. And that sense of openness that I went into this trip with was filled. Filled with a realization that every day I can decide which way I am going to follow. And that is important for me to remember. I didn't necessarily have to go on this 10-day hike to do it, but it helped. (laughs) Because I can get sidetracked very easily. And once I do get sidetracked, well, I don't know about you, but I don't always get back on track right away it can admittedly take a while. So it is better if I know which way I should be going each and every day and make that decision each and every day to follow that path. (laughs) Sometimes the path is easy to follow and is laid out right before you. Sometimes there are multiple paths or twists and turns and you need to decide which way to follow. On the Camino, on the hike, every time there was more than one way to go, there was always something yellow directing you. Maybe somebody painted a yellow arrow on a rock that's been there for who knows how long or scallop shells are kind of an image of the Camino so a scallop shell would be painted or... Uh, a clay one would be there sort of showing you or, or now in more modern times they put in uh, mile markers, kilometer markers about, about that big that tell you how far you've walked, what kilometer you're at and go that way. It's actually pretty hard to get lost on the Camino if you are paying attention to all the little things that are helping you show you the way. You can miss them, of course. And then you might have to backtrack miles to get back on the right path. Just like life, right? For life is a journey with many twists and turns. And if we do not have something to follow, we may find ourselves miles off track wondering how to get back to where we need to be. You know, earlier this year, we began talking about a feeling a lot of us were having, that whole feeling of something's coming, remember? We had felt a little stagnated over what was indeed a very long and cold winter. And when we were literally able to come back to church after being closed, actually, during some of the icy conditions, there was indeed this sense of something's coming. 
And while I, I could not put my finger on it back then, I too knew that whatever it was to be viable in our lives, we needed to perceive it as coming from God. When I first got back from my trip, just one week ago, several people asked me if I had figured out what this thing is that we keep saying is coming. And I'm sorry, but my answer is no. I did not figure this out on my trip. It wasn't really the purpose of my going on this trip to figure that out. Now, I did think about you and the church a lot, walking six, eight, ten hours a day. I had a lot of time to do that, and I did pray for you all. And what I did come to realize is that, aside from one or two things I'm interested in doing that might be new, what I need to do is not decide for you what you might want to do, and instead listen to you. For a while, it's worked for several years for, for some, when I would announce every year that, you know, we're going to have one Bible study on Wednesday night, and we're going to have another one on Thursday morning, and it's going to be the exact same topic, and please come. Well, that, again, worked for some, but it didn't work for everyone. The day, the time, the topic, or, or a combination of all three just didn't work. We're still doing some of those things, but what else, what else could we do? And so I did learn something on my Camino, my walk. And what I learned is that while we were all on a similar journey, a journey to help bring us closer to one another and God, we may not all get there the same way. And so I would like to ask this morning for your help and invite each and every one of us to think of ways and things that you may want from being part of this community. And then share those ideas with others. What I plan to do is to help create the environment and some actual mechanisms for sharing those ideas. But the implementation of those things that may be coming is going to need all of our participation. I'll share this next thought only because it has been shared with me. And that is that over the years, a lot of things got done because a lot of the same people did them. And that's a wonderful thing to have that much positive energy for so long in one place. But that can also have an unwanted effect of making it appear, anyway, that things just always get done and that other people may not be needed. Well, let me suggest this. That the first something's coming thing that needs to come is a new understanding about that. For there is no one group of people that does everything. There really isn't. Just like I keep saying there's no thing called church that does not include every single person sitting in this room. This building is not our church. This is our church. When Samuel was a young man, he had already been living and working at the church, the temple, for a number of years. And he thought he knew exactly what his place was, what he was expected to do, and what I imagine what he was not expected or invited to do. 
And so when God called to him one night, he didn't even recognize God's voice and instead went to Eli, who was in charge of keeping everything at the temple, and and Eli tells him, I didn't call you, go back to bed. Which Samuel did. Because Samuel always did what Eli told him to do. He didn't think for himself. Well, God, who did not get a reply from Samuel, calls to him a second time, and And for a second time, Samuel thinks it's Eli again and goes to Eli once more, and Eli tells him, I didn't call you, go back to bed. Which he does. And then a third time, this exact same thing happens. Only this time, it's Eli who realizes what's going on. And so he tells Samuel, next time you hear the Lord call you, don't come to me. Answer saying, Here I am, Lord. Speak, for your servant is listening. You see, Samuel, even as a young man, thought he knew exactly what was expected of him for the rest of his life. He was supposed to be a low level worker in the temple, always under the instruction of someone else never really making his own decisions. For not only was Eli in charge of the temple, but Eli had two other sons who were there going to take over from him when they got older. Samuel was not expected to rise to much at all in his life. And since this was his expectation, he had no clue whatsoever when God started calling his name. Three times God called to him. And three times Samuel didn't even think for a second that it was God. He had no way of knowing. Part of the irony of this story is that it was Eli who had to tell Samuel that, wait a minute, this is the Lord calling you. And when Samuel finally heard the Lord's call, he went from being a a chore boy to one of the greatest prophets in the Lord's service. Growing up to become the one that anointed both Saul and David as the first two kings of Israel. Eli did not tell Samuel what God wanted. He only told him to listen. Well, my friends, now that I have returned from my own personal pilgrimage, I can tell you that I do feel refreshed and renewed to be your pastor and to help lead us all to green and verdant pastures. But I also came back knowing that it's not about me telling you what to do, but I'd rather asking you what you would like to do and how I, how we, can help. So I guess I'm asking each of you to dream a little bit. Dream a little bit about your own life and dream a a little bit about our shared lives. There's a quote from, about dreams from, from Christopher Reeve, you know, Superman who then had an accident and was paralyzed the rest of his life. And during that time of his life, he said this, at first, dreams seem impossible. Then, improbable. And then, inevitable. Well, let us move forward together to whatever it is that God has already deemed inevitable for St. Jude's and for every single person, past, present, and future, who make up our little community called St. Jude's. And let me close by saying once again, it is truly good to be back in the house of the Lord and in your company once again. Amen. 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 Will you pray with me, please? 
Holy God, you meet us in the ordinary routines of our lives. You sometimes surprise us with your presence. You see us as we are and help us to see who we can become. Strengthen us, dear Lord, when we weigh ourselves down with burdens you would gladly take from us. Restore us to ourselves and reconcile us to one another. Grant us the compassion of Christ in our hearts. Fill us with a thirst for your righteousness and instill in us a passion to do your kingdom's work. Holy One, we pray this day for those who are grieving, ill, and suffering. Touch them with your healing hand and give them your peace. And help us, O God, to be a channel through which your love, mercy, and peace can flow towards others. And open our hearts so we may receive and share in the blessings of your desire. This, dear God, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.